Hello and welcome to July's Fiction at the Friary, currently a virtual event, though we look forward to being back in person at the Friary Bar in the hopefully not too distant future on the last Sunday of every month. I'm Danielle McLaughlin and I'm here today with my co-host Madeleine Darcy and this month's featured author Emma Ryan. Before we begin, a quick word of thanks to our sponsors, who this year are Cork City Council, the Arts Council, Cork City Libraries, the Department of English, UCC, Hogan Architects, J. Raffle Morris Listers, and Mike Darcy of the, Friary, of the Friary Bar, who has hosted us so generously from the start. As usual, we have a free book raffle happening after this event, and we'll have details on how you can take part in that a little later on. Now I'm going to hand over to Madeline, who will introduce this month's featured author. Danielle and myself are delighted to welcome Emma Ryan back to Fiction at the Friary. In January this year, I asked Emma to co-host with me when Danielle's debut novel came out so that we could talk to her about it. And in a delightful synchronicity, we're now back with Danielle and myself talking to Emer about her own debut novel. Um, it's such a pleasure to have Emer as our guest because we know her and her work for quite a few years now. And it's wonderful to see her writing career flourish. She's originally from Tipperary, but we claim her now for Cork City particularly since she's currently the writer in residence at UCC for 2021 to 2022. Holding Her Breath is Emer's debut novel and has received stellar reviews. And she's also a short story writer and essayist. Her writing has appeared in literary journals and anthologies, including Granta, Winter Papers, The Dublin Review and Stinging Fly, The Long Gaze Back, and Town & Country. She's also a co-founder of the literary journal Banshee and its publishing arm, Banshee Press. And she's also a sports columnist with the Irish Examiner and has written about women in sport for the 42.ie, Image, Stranger's Guide, Winter Papers and Elsewhere. And uh, we're delighted to welcome Emer as our guest author this month. I wonder, Emer, would you mind kicking us off by reading um, a piece from Holding Our Breath? Thanks a million Madeline and Danielle for the, the lovely welcome. Delighted to be back at Fiction with Friary. As Danielle says, hopefully it won't be too long before we're, we're back in person. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just read about five minutes from early on in the book. Um, Holding Her Breath is basically a coming of age story. Um, the central character's name is Beth Crow and she's just going into her first year of university and kind of trying to find herself. Um, she's had two very strong identities, if you like, looming over her for a, a good part of her life. One is that she's a former elite swimmer and she's now trying to kind of, uh, she's quit kind of play, uh, swimming at a high level and she's now kind of trying to come back to the sport on her own terms. And the other kind of big identity that she has is that she is the granddaughter of a famous poet, Benjamin Crow who died by suicide um, in the 1980s before Beth was born. And going into university, she kind of encounters a lot of people who love her grandfather's work and who are kind of obsessed with his life and death. Um, and that kind of draws her into her family history. And in this scene here that I'm going to read, um, she is gone home to visit her grandmother, Lydia, who is uh, Benjamin's widow and is also the kind of ferocious um, guardian of his archive. Lydia's attic bedroom tops the house like a crown on a corpulent king. Beth ends up spending the evening there, typing up her grandmother's latest project, an essay on neglected Irish women writers of the 19th century. Lydia dictates, sometimes from her creased hands tattooed with biro notes. She's ambidextrous. As soon as she fills one palm, she starts on the other, each hand with its own distinctive style. When they finish, Lydia hefts herself out of her old purple armchair and pours glasses of sherry from a tray in her window alcove. Beth wanders over to the bookshelves under the sloping ceilings, running her hands over the familiar cracked spines. 
Most of the books here have a personal connection. Anthologies Lydia edited. Every issue of Redgate Review, Lydia's defunct feminist literary journal. And of course, multiple editions of every collection of poetry by Benjamin Crow. So tell us, Lydia says, sitting back down with the drinks, how's the alma mater? Beth wheels over an office chair so that she can sit opposite her. You should come visit me, see for yourself. Uh, I'd only be hounded. Those lads in the English department are shameless, sniffing around as if I'm about to drop dead and leave the whole archive to them. She half nods towards the far wall, lined and stacked with ageing cardboard boxes. You could pass for a student, Gran. You blend right in. Beth is only half joking. Lydia's outfit of yellow cardigan, floral shift dress and brown brogues could easily be transplanted onto the art students she sees stream through campus every day. Only the flesh tone tights and glasses chain betray her. I go away out of that. Lydia swats in Beth's direction with the second glass. Beth takes it, pretends to sip. I met your boyfriend, by the way, she says. Which one? Justin Kelleher. My roommate is in one of his classes. He called here a couple of years ago, didn't he? Lydia nods. An aggressive young bucko, if I remember rightly, trying to tell me my business. That's what you think about every academic, Gran. He was worse than most, wanting me to put a narrative shape on your grandfather's death, if you can believe it. Lydia adopts a deep, plummy voice. With respect, Miss Blackwood, if that's not a spouse's duty, then it's certainly an editor's. Beth winces. He said that? A gobshite, but not hard to look at, in fairness to him, Lydia says. He was asking for you anyway. Pay no attention to that fella. Don't tell me he's the only interesting person you've met so far. She crosses her arms. I haven't met my future spouse yet, anyway. You and Graddad set the bar pretty high on that front. Lydia has told Beth the story of meeting Ben a handful of times. Now that Beth thinks of it, it was a lot more scandalous than she realised as a kid. A 20-something lecturer setting her eyes on a first-year student in the front row and deciding she had to have him. He had that sense of newness about him, Lydia would say in the telling. That broad Midlands accent and that shock of russet hair. Like he literally came out of the landscape he was born into. Sitting there in the university. Of course, it wouldn't have worked at all, that awkward look, if he hadn't also been a genius. That was apparent very early on. And to hear him read poetry was, well, he had the voice of a much older man, like he had a lifetime's worth of sorrows lodged in his throat. Now Lydia is looking at Beth sharp-eyed. Be careful on campus, you. That place does things to you. The cherry blossoms, the cobbles, the sense of history. A very ordinary man can look irresistible in the right context. Have your wits about you. Don't be worrying, Gran. Because more often than not, these things end in tears. Yes, Gran. Lydia's palm comes down hard on the table between them, rattling the glassware. I'm serious, girl. I know what it's like to be bowled over by someone's charisma. It makes it easy to do things you know you shouldn't. Beth reaches out a tentative hand, lays it on Lydia's arm. Her muscles are rigid beneath her yellow sleeve. Don't ever hit yourself to another person, Beth. Do you know what I mean by that? I'm not saying don't have relationships, but if anyone ever refers to you as their better half, drop them, you hear? Don't let yourself become half of the whole. I won't. Beth doesn't know what else to say. Good, good. Lydia adjusts the glasses on her nose, fumbles with the cap of the sherry bottle. She doesn't offer another drink. Beth knows she's dismissed without needing to be told. Thanks. Thank you so much, Emer, um, and congratulations on holding her breath. I loved it. It's an absolutely fantastic read. And listening to you reading that piece with Beth and Lydia there, I thought I might start with a question about Lydia, who is such a sharp and formidable character. And I love the way you write the relationship between Beth and Lydia. Um, was was Lydia always there from the very beginning of the novel for you? At what point did she come into the story? 
Lydia was always there. Yeah. Um, I love characters like that, these kind of formidable old dames, you know, who are the smartest people in the room, um, frequently underestimated, uh, kind of don't really care what people think of them. Um, just very strong characters. And I, yeah, she was always kind of in the mix. I think when I thought of, when I was originally conceiving this story, one of the books that I kind of took um, a lot of inspiration from was Janet Malcolm's The Silent Woman, which is about Sylvia Plath's legacy after her death and how the Hughes family kind of very closely guarded her papers and her archive, which made it very difficult for scholars to kind of tell the full story, if you like. Um, and so Lydia is kind of in some ways modeled on Alwyn Hughes, who was um, the kind of fierce custodian of, of both Sylvia Plath's and Ted Hughes's archives. Um, so there's a little bit of her in it and, you know, lots of kind of influence from, we'll say, um, the Countess, the Dowager Countess in, in Downton Abbey was someone who I had in mind as well for, <laughs> for Lydia. Um, so very much that kind of character. Uh, she's one of my favourites. You invented a fictional poet for, for this novel. Um, did you find yourself actually writing pieces of poetry that, that he might have written? I did, yeah. I wrote um, lots of poems for, for Benjamin. My original plan actually was to write them and perform them in various places around Cork, particularly Ovale. And I think in the end, my courage kind of failed me because I realised the poems weren't that great. Um, but at the same time, as a writer, it was a really useful exercise for me to actually physically write, I think it was about a dozen different poems um, for Ben, just to kind of figure out, you know, the context of the time that he would have been writing in, what his themes would have been, what his interests would have been, um, who else was writing at the same time as him and how they might have influenced him. And even though, as I said, the poems weren't great, I was still able to kind of pick out titles and maybe lines here and there that I could kind of sprinkle throughout the text because I, I really wanted the reader to get a sense of there is a back catalogue here, you know, there is a body of work um, behind this, this fictional poet. Um, and so I think, I think in, in some early drafts I actually had the poems themselves appearing in full but I think it works better with just the kind of the little hints here and there, because I think it kind of evokes a larger body of work without actually having to, to put the poems down on paper. So that was the, the process there. You know that now that we know they exist. Um, maybe not today, but sometime <laughs> we're going to ask you to read us oh, no. <laughs> those poems. I think it's a great idea. The um, a body of poems that are linked to the novel and that kind of exist now because you've made them outside the novel. I think that is so interesting. And I, I must say, I love your idea of performing them, um, kind of where they have a life of their own, but, but linked to this story as well. Um, Beth herself is, she's very sporty and swimming is a very big part of her life. Um, you're a sports writer as well as a fiction writer and I know you play sport yourself and I don't play sport at all but I'm always fascinated when I listen to people who do play sport um, the way they talk about the psychology of sport and I'm curious as to whether you think that there are perhaps similarities between the psychology of sport and the psychology of writing. For me, they, they feel very different, and but in that way, they, they complement each other really well. Um, I suppose maybe with swimming and writing, there is more of a, a similarity because they're both very solitary, you know, and they both involve a lot of repetitive practice um, and a lot of, of, you know, imperfection and, and, and just kind of, I suppose, practicing and practicing until until you're kind of doing it automatically you know um yeah for for me sports and writing feel like very different parts of my life um probably because I play team sports so you know it's it's nice to kind of run out on the pitch and have other people around which is very different from writing where you're kind of alone in your in your room and in your own head 
Um, and for, sport kind of gives me um, a chance to kind of physically express myself, whereas writing feels more kind of mental and, and, and emotional. Um, so yeah, they, they, they feel like very different realms for me. I think as well, there's there's a slightly different way of being in, in both worlds. Um, like, I think writing is very much about vulnerability and um, acknowledging that we're all flawed people, you know, and whereas sport is about trying to be the best version of yourself and the strongest, bravest, fastest um, self that you can be. And I, I like both. I like having both in my life because I think that they both stretch me uh, in different ways. Um, but yeah, it was it was important to me that Beth would be a sports person because I think it does change the way that you navigate the world, especially as a young woman. Um, you're getting so many messages from from the media and from society about beauty standards and, and unrealistic expectations around body image. And I think sport kind of gives you a counter narrative to that. You know, it, it, it kind of gets you to think of your yourself through the lens of strength and and utility rather than you know beauty um and so i really wanted her to have that attitude to herself i know that well my experience is that all parts of writing a novel are difficult but what's there if i was to say what's the part that you found the most challenging what aspect of the novel did you find the most challenging to work with Definitely editing. I find editing so tough. Um, I love first drafts because I suppose you're you're kind of caught up in the the novelty of the ideas that you're putting together. Um, you're kind of you're in love with your characters and you're just trying to tell their story, um, and it's very kind of free and fun stage of the writing. I think, but I find editing really tough because definitely. For me anyway, I can only see the flaws. It's very hard for me to see the the good parts, you know, and it was strange. I, I, I felt like a great responsibility to the story and to the characters that I was working with. And I kind of knew the first draft while I got all the ideas down and the basic plot never changed a huge amount, but I kind of knew I wasn't doing it proper justice, you know? Um, and I suppose I wrote the first draft when I was maybe 27 or 28 and I'm now 34 with the book just published so I think in a lot of ways over the years with the drafts I kind of matured and became more able to tell the story in the way that it needed to be told um I think initially I had the idea and I I wanted to write it but some of the some of the themes some of the heavier themes I probably wasn't doing them proper justice so the book has kind of grown with me over the years could we ask you to read another little extract for us, if you wouldn't mind? Yeah, no problem. Um, I'm going to read another Lydia section. <laughs> Probably clear that he, she's one of my favourite characters. Yeah, I love Lydia. <laughs> this is from later in the book. Um, and it's actually when, when Lydia is, is dying. And this was originally a, a prologue to the book in, in earlier drafts. So in, in some ways it, it still feels like the start of the book to me, even though it now appears kind of in the in the last third. Um, so it's about five minutes, so I'll just read from there. Towards the end, Lydia is very much herself. The suggestion that she'll be moved downstairs is dismissed. I'll be six feet under soon enough. I'm going to enjoy the elevation while I can. Soon they're all drawn into the performance. The last few days are a coordinated dance around the bed in the attic. Beth and her mother with cameos from Pierce, Lydia's GP, and a palliative care nurse from the local hospice. Her name is Susan, and she always gently shepherds Beth into a corner of the room when she's turning Lydia or changing the sheets. Somehow, all that this gesture suggests is more frightening to Beth than actually seeing the realities of end of life. This will happen to my mother, she finds herself thinking. This will happen to my father. Her parents begin to speak in hushed voices, as if trying to soothe a dying animal. Lydia herself continues to defiantly give orders. Pile up them pillows. Scratch the top of my spine. No, lower. What's keeping the tea? As she weakens, she softs off the clipped edges of her university accent, returns to her yearning cork roots. When her voice loses power and she can no longer speak loudly, 
Beth finds herself raising her own voice as if she could lend her some volume. She has never seen anyone or anything die before, but when it happens, Beth has no doubt, no moment of denial. It's just her and her mother. Pierce is at work, Susan downstairs making a cup of tea after a long night's vigil. Lydia's breaths become long and rattly and Alice glances at Beth, meeting her eye. They do not call for Susan. They both place their hands over Lydia's, huge mounds under the covers and watch her fade out. It's unmistakable. She's with dad now, says Alice, taking deep, steadying breaths. This rare invocation of Benjamin feels so momentous that Beth wants it to be real, that Lydia will meet him on the other side, wherever that might be. But because Lydia herself never believed in that sort of thing, Beth finds that she can't either. Her mother picks the outfit while Beth and Pierce tidy the dining room and move the table to the garage. The room is to have a new focal point now. Beth lines the perimeter with all the chairs they own. Pierce contributes another six from his own kitchen. The first visitors, guests, mourners, arrive and Beth supposes that it is awake now. She still hasn't cried. She occupies herself carrying trays and dishes for the academics and poets who stand in tight bands of anecdote and laughter. She stares a little too long at a film director and a former government minister deep in conversation. Later in the kitchen, a famous playwright stumbles over his sympathies, gesticulating with a brandy glass. She isn't particularly a fan of any of these people, but nevertheless, there it is. The flaring in her cheeks, the shifting in her stomach that says, I'm in the presence of power. The days before the funeral are full of small, quiet shocks. Sadie and Jess arrive wearing black, tentatively pushing through the crowds, looking far younger somehow than they do on campus. Beth thinks about the care they've shown in being here, texting each other, looking up directions online, coordinating lifts, and starts weeping openly. They're alarmed, but they hug her and tell her they're sorry. It's hard to have a conversation there in the sea of handshakes and sympathy. They stay for an hour, pausing to respectfully regard Lydia in her coffin. I wish I'd met her, Sadie says, and Beth wishes it too, and rebukes herself for not making it happen. Later, Beth sees her parents hugging, properly hugging, not the cursory one-armed clasp they give each other on birthdays. They confer often, working the room like TV cops giving each other cover. Her father mixes drinks for Lydia's cousins. He knows where to find the glasses and spoons, the cloves and sugar bowl. Her mother handles the mourners with an ease and grace that startles Beth. Alice soothes the cheerful ones. She lets the awkward shufflers know that their presence is comfort enough. Beth isn't used to seeing her mother interact with the public. She feels proud of her poise. It's only late in the day that it hits her. Alice has been preparing for Lydia to die. She's been quietly in readiness for a long time. It was a good death, Beth hears her mother say over and over. Slight emphasis on good to distinguish it from the other bad one. This is Beth's first real death, so she has nothing to compare it to. Thanks. I, I love all your characters, especially Lydia, the grandmother, the grand dame. Um, you have actually uh, uh, quite a cast of characters uh, that you've had to juggle throughout the novel, and they're wonderful because um, uh, they all seem so perfectly placed in their scenes in order to provide more knowledge about um, the plot itself and about Beth's character. And I'm just wondering, um, did you start and finish with all the same characters or did you have to dispose of some of them and create other characters along the way? Definitely. Um, there was definitely a couple. Of, I, th I think this is quite common in, in the drafting of a novel that you'll often have maybe two side characters who are essentially doing the same job. And um, at some point in the drafting process, you kind of realise this could just be one character and it would make things, you know, much simpler and, um, and straightforward. So that definitely happened. There was originally another love interest besides Justin. 
um, who was kind of a, a, a rival for, for Beth's affections. And um, at a certain point, I kind of realized these two guys are doing the same, the same, playing the same role, I suppose, in, in the novel. And it, it probably makes more sense to uh, just make them one. So yeah, the, the, the cast of characters um, probably shrank a little bit with, with the drafts and probably um, became a bit tighter and more focused. Uh, but they were all there in some form from the beginning. They're, they're in, in, incredibly well-drawn characters. I mean, from Sadie, the roommate who you kind of expect might um, not get on with Beth, but um, has her own, um, there's a lovely bit of comedic dialogue there. And um, of course there's Justin, which brings me to um, say that the sex in the book, if you'll forgive me, is so good. <laughs> and by that I mean, firstly, the scenes are incredibly well written, they're natural, they're not overblown, they're germane to the plot, they're appropriate to the emotional core of whatever is going on, and they're consensual. Um, Beth is to some extent in control of herself. She's quite mature in some ways for her age, which is 20, 21? 20, um, yeah. Yep. Um, and uh, did you find these uh, scenes easy to write or is it very difficult to hit the right note? Writing sex scenes is, is generally difficult, I suppose, because um, you're self-conscious, you know, you're, you're very conscious of, I suppose, you know, not ending up in the bad sex awards or <laughs> not kind of being overly flowery um, or metaphorical or overblown in your language. So for me, it was constantly about just trying to bring it back to, um, I suppose, what the person is feeling in the moment. Um, and that can be, you know, very, everyday in some ways you know I suppose it was about just trying to describe it as in, in as everyday and as natural a way as I could um, and as straightforwardly as I could and Beth is kind of on a journey where growing up she was so dedicated to her sport that there are kind of certain coming of age things that she missed out on um, there are a couple of moments early on where she realizes she doesn't have a sense of style um, because growing up she would have been in a school uniform and then straight into her her sportswear in the evenings because she was just so um dedicated to to, to her sport that she kind of never really developed had those kind of usual teen coming of age experiences where you develop a sense of style and things like that um and suddenly she's at university and everyone else seems to have that figured out about themselves and it's kind of similar with relationships she has one kind of on again on off again boyfriend Cormac who um if he's not dating her he's going out with another swimmer Marina and they kind of pass him back and forth almost you know um but that's the extent of her experience with 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 boys and with men so when she meets Justin um she kind of knows I think from the start that it's not going to end well that this is a very compromised situation um he's a postdoc student at the university he he's a lecturer occasionally he's not her lecturer but he's still kind of in that position of, of authority and power and she knows it's it's wrong he's also in a, in a, in a relationship himself um, so she knows that it's a very compromised situation and that it, it probably won't last but she still wants to have the experience of it almost to kind of explore her own emotional and sexual um, horizons and so that's kind of her goal with the relationship rather than you know winning him over or getting him to leave his girlfriend what she's looking for is, is experience um, and it, it's interesting that you mentioned consent because I, I think I was very conscious as well when I was writing these characters that they're younger than I am um, I suppose I'm a millennial they're Gen Z and one thing that I think is great about Gen Z is that they're so open and accepting of things like you know sexual orientation or, or gender identity um, and their own kind of, I suppose, sexual morality they have is consent. You know, they, I think anything goes as long as everyone involved is 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 happy to, to be involved. And so that was kind of something that I, I kept in mind as well when I was writing these characters. 
I've just got one more question, Emer. I was gonna um, ask you about uh, the structure is really, really tight. The story is told during one semester and with the holidays after that, but th there's a lot of backstory dealing with the different strands that you have had to feed into the novel. Um, concerning Beth's career, her love life, her college life, and her family history, of course. Um, and you've used her grandfather's poetry, her grandmother's memorabilia, and um, a biography, various uh, things. And did you find that difficult? And I was wondering in particular, uh, how you decided, or is it just instinctual that you've know how and when to filter in the backstories and was there a lot of editing for example did you originally intend perhaps to use her therapist therapy sessions to um, filter the knowledge that the reader needs at certain points I'm just really interested because it, it's just so well done and so tight it's really really skillful I loved it so I'm looking for hints here. <laughs> yeah, I suppose there were so many drafts of the novel and structure was one of the things that really changed a lot between the different drafts. Like I think early on, I remember every every second chapter used to go back and forth between Beth's story and then um, Ben and Lydia's story kind of back in the 1980s. And so it was kind of toggling between these two timelines and Part of that was because I just loved the Ben and Lydia story so much that they sometimes kind of threatened to take over the narrative altogether. Um, but I realised at, at a certain point it wasn't really working and that Beth had to be the focus and that Ben and Lydia would have to be this kind of underlying kind of haunting presence in the book rather than the focus of it. Um, I think I was really strongly influenced by Middlesex by Jeffrey Eugenides, which has a similar back and forth structure between uh, the main character, Cal, and the, the, the grandparents. Um, but it, it wasn't really working in my novel. So in the end, I ended, ended up just telling it in a much more linear way, like you say, over the course of, of one year in college um, from Beth's perspective. But yeah, between the, 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 between Lydia's archives and between Ben's poetry, I realized I was really inspired by certain books that have a kind of an explosive manuscript in them, like a book within a book. And this is something that you kind of only notice in retrospect, but um, Julian Barnes's The Sense of an Ending, there's kind of a, an explosive diary in that story that kind of brings brings the past up for, um, for the characters and kind of upends their lives. And there's another book called Tony and Susan. Um, I forget the name of the author, <clears throat> excuse me, but it was adapted for film uh, as a, a, a film called Nocturnal Animals with um, Amy Adams and Jake Gyllenhaal. It's a very good movie. But like, again, that's um, a separated husband and wife, a divorced husband and wife. And the husband sends the wife a draft of a novel that he's been working on. So when you're reading Tony and Susan, you're kind of reading the novel within the novel and you're reading um, the wife's kind of reactions to the manuscript that she's been sent. So. I loved that idea of um, kind of documents from the past, I suppose, um, having an, an effect on the present day lives of the characters and kind of forcing them to reconfigure um, the family stories and the family myths that they've always believed in. It's a, an absolutely wonderful book um, and congratulations on it. It's just a delight now that um, it's finally out. Thanks so much, Madeline. Um, Before we go, Emer, can you just tell us a little bit about what you're working on at the moment? I know you're currently writing in residence at UCC and you're also um, a publisher and editor of Banshee and you write short stories, you do sports writing as well as writing fiction. And I'm wondering how you managed to carve the time out for all of that and what, what current projects you have on? Yeah, I, I've loved being writer in residence in UCC so much because I think for the first time ever, I can kind of make writing my day job, which has been like just brilliant for the last six months. 
Um, so I, I kind of get up in the morning and, and do my writing first thing, or I suppose between nine and 12, really. And then the rest of the day then is for um, writing for the examiner or for Banshee or other kind of admin bits. Um, but in terms of Banshee, we've just released um, a brilliant book of short stories by Deirdre Sullivan called I Want to Know That I Will Be Okay. Fabulous <laughs> collection. I've read it. It's superb. Yeah. Super book. Yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. And we're also soon going to bring out um, a paperback format of our very first book with Banshee, um, Paris Syndrome by Lucy Sweeney Byrne, which is another wonderful collection. Um, and we'll have issue 12 coming out in the autumn, which is being guest edited by John Patrick McHugh, the brilliant short story writer, and Jessica Trainer, um, the wonderful poet. So looking forward to that. And in terms of my own writing, then I'm working on a collection of uh, essays about growing up as a, as a young woman within the GAA and um, kind of loving this sport and dedicating yourself to this sport that maybe doesn't love you back um, because of your gender. And so I'm working on that at the moment. And it's been really interesting, actually, to write about sports in a kind of a more straightforward nonfiction way after having funneled a lot of those feelings and emotions into um into the novel so I'm kind of it's it's it's, it's a new thing but I'm, I'm really enjoying it so that's that's what I'm working on at the moment. I can remember reading one of your sports essays I think it was in winter papers would that have been right and I was just blown away by it so yeah I'm hugely looking forward to to that book as well. Um I think that's yes I think that's us for today. Um, we have a free book raffle happening after the event today. So if you go to our Twitter account at Fiction Friary or our Facebook page, Fiction at the Friary, we'll have details there on how you can take part in the free book raffle. So I suppose it's um, at the end of this month's Fiction at the Friary. Um, Danielle, thank you so much. Emer, thank you so much for being our guest author this month. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. And we are, don't have Fiction at the Ferry in August. That's our month off. We'll be back in September. Thanks so much, guys. It was a pleasure chatting to you. Thanks so much. <laughs>